So um, before I kind of dive in, I want to give you just a little bit of information about who I am, how I arrived here. My name is Dr. Maggie Mapes. I am a faculty member in the Department of Communication Studies at the University of Kansas. My title is Introductory Course Director. Um, I like to joke that when I started as an educator, I didn't think I would be spending so much time talking about open textbooks, um, but my role as an introductory course director really led me here because I'm responsible for making curricular choices for around 25 to 3,500 students every year. I learned really quickly that publishing reps were very invested um, in spending time with me and trying to persuade me to adopt those books. I quickly realized then that there are so many ethical considerations that we need to place at the forefront when we're making choices about textbooks and other educational resources. The second part of my sort of life as a faculty member is research, and I study pedagogy, and I'm most interested in inclusive pedagogy, critical pedagogy projects. So that is what brings me here a little bit with you today. So again, taking just a little bit of a step back, you'll notice that the sort of arc, uh, the narrative arc of this presentation is really focused on a problem solution model that asks faculty members to do something as a form of call to action. So I mentioned that again, because um, as someone who studies public speaking, I know it can be helpful to think about that overall meta framework and organization for a presentation as you think about what's gonna work for you and how you're gonna adapt it to meet the needs of your own faculty. I want you to think um, and ask yourself, what brings you here? And I don't mean here as in the workshop. I mean, what brought you to education? What made you understand education as being the place that you wanted to land for your career, to show up to work every day? Um, if I think about it for myself, um, I, of course, believe in education. I think education matters, that to provide everyone access to education is meaningful, not just for the advancement of their own life, but really for broader community good, for the reduction of social justice. Um, that's what really gets me up and motivates me every day. And the UN Declaration of Human Rights reflects that commitment, right, is that uh, higher education should be um, equally accessible to all. And when I was younger, although I still had that commitment, when I thought about providing access, equitable access to education, I really thought about it as a place, a space. Everyone should be able to have access to a public school. Right? We, sh they, we should be able to provide anyone with the means to advance themselves through education. Um, but I think COVID really spotlighted a lot of additional barriers that can prohibit accessibility. So throughout um, today, when we talk about access, we're really talking about inclusivity and social justice. This is such an important place to start for the workshop because it brings faculty back into their value system and really, again, reminds us that we are all unified towards that commitment. Solving problems in our society is always gonna go back to those questions of education. And we need as many people as possible, especially now, um, working towards that common good. So we all believe in the transformational potential of education, that everyone should have access to inclusive education. But there's a problem. We're not really living up to that promise. So um, this graph shows us how the burden then of higher education has shifted from the state to the student. If you want to take a look here, you'll notice that that kind of orange line is state funding and the purple line is tuition. What you're going to notice is, of course, that as soon as state funding is reduced, that that burden becomes uh, more response, more um, shifted to the student onto those tuition costs. So we know that the financial load for students has doubled. And we can make this more specific even to our own states. I, of course, am at the University of Kansas, and my graph is even more troublesome, right? When we think about how much tuition is having to make up for that reduction of funding. And according to the Institute of College Access and Success, nationally, right, more than six in 10, six in 10 graduating seniors had student loans with an average debt of almost $30,000. And that's just if you actually um, make it to the end, right? Some people have tremendous amounts of student debt and don't actually have the degree to show for it. 
Okay. So unfortunately, these last couple of slides aren't going to surprise many of us because they're experiences that we're having on our own campus as well. We are seeing drastic pay cuts at our institutions. We're doing way, way more with less. I have many colleagues, for example, who aren't sure they will ever get travel or research funds back after COVID cuts. Um, and so while we're experiencing them, this data really reminds us that it is students that are making up the difference, that have devastating consequences, really mainly that we are not able to fulfill the burden of providing access, of providing equitable access. Here's just a little um, example from my campus. A few years ago, KU joined hundreds of other campuses across um, the United States and got a food pantry. It's obviously important to be able to provide access of food for students. And I was noticing that that food pantry was being used to market for new students, which is a little bit mind blowing if you think about it, that we aren't really just recruiting on good education, um, on what we're doing on campuses, but we're acknowledging that there's a problem so much so that we have to recruit students um, by persuading them to come to a campus because they'll have access to a food pantry, right? So this kind of data, these sort of anecdotes um, are um, troublesome, right? So when we talk about access to higher education, we have to acknowledge that college is expensive and that alone makes it really inaccessible for a lot of people. These are kind of five major costs of attendance, major expense categories, tuition and fees, housing, books and supplies, personal expenses and transportation. What do you think we're going to spend the remainder of our time today talking about? Which of these categories? Absolutely, it is books and supplies. And that's because it's the category that faculty have the most advocacy over. I've been waiting for someone to knock on my door to ask me what we should do about our tuition crisis. Hopefully someday um, I'll be able to contribute. But right now, right, as faculty, we know that um, faculty have the kind of most advocacy over being able to make a change about this expense category. And this is really, really important framing for faculty um, on your campus actually, because in my experience, um, when I was coming up as a new graduate student, making choices about course material, including um, textbooks, deciding based on a more traditional publishers was just a really normal and natural way to make decisions. I just thought everyone chose very, very expensive textbooks. And so helping faculty really understand that the choices that they're making have important and long-term consequences for students, that that is a really important ethical component um, is, is necessary to consider. So I know you're wondering though, you know, what are students really paying for their books? And the federal government, of course, mandates that we have to communicate with students some um, ideas about mandatory costs of attendance and things like books and supplies. Overall, you'll see here that students are told uh, to budget around $1,200 to $1,400 for books. When I looked up the University of Kansas for this year, we're telling students that they should, they should um, budget around $1,200. Uh, $1,200 is a lot of money for anyone. And what we're noticing, though, is that that's not actually what students are spending. They're only really spending around $400. What do you think is making up the difference? What accounts for the difference between what we're telling students they should budget for and the amount of money they're actually spending? Absolutely, Taylor. They might not be able to actually purchase that, the, purchase the book. Are there any other reasons you could think of that might account for that difference? Yes, sharing. Yep, rent, borrow, share, pirate, 100%. And I think this is really, really important because students are savvy and they're making difficult choices, not because they want to, but because the cost is really, really insurmountable. $1,200 is a lot of money for me, right? much less students. Okay. Um, and so they are making those really, really difficult choices. And those are risky choices for many of them, right? Maybe they have to delay purchasing and they miss the first quiz, for example. I like to remind faculty here in an attempt to sort of reframe some of their experiences, right? That if we acknowledge that textbooks are really, really expensive, that students, when they show up on the first day of class and they might not have the book, that isn't because they are lazy or they don't like they don't like you or they're not interested in your class, but actually data really tells us more likely uh, is that they can't actually afford to purchase the book or the course materials that have been assigned in the class. 
And we know that regardless of how much students are actually spending on course materials, that there is an impact of that cost. Um, we know, of course, that textbook costs affect students financially, but this is one of my favorite pieces of data to show because it explicitly connects that financial barrier or that cost with actual academic success, the impact that that has on the student experience. So in this survey, um, this is around 21,000 students who participated in a survey done by the Florida Virtual Campus Office of Distance Learning and Student Services. And the survey examined textbook affordability uh, for Florida's public higher education um, institutions. They were asked, in your academic career, has the cost of the required textbook caused you to? And we might not be surprised, right, especially based on our answers in the chat, to know that 64% indicated, I didn't buy the textbook. I wasn't able to purchase the book. These other um, responses, though, really help give us insight into the multiple consequences that occur when students are faced with that financial barrier. 17%, right, failing a course, having to withdraw from a course. Um, we have 40% of people who are not registering for a specific class um, because they're looking up and aren't able to afford those costs. So um, this survey is really, really key, again, to make that connection between cost and student success um, explicit as you're making the connection to the problem for faculty audiences. I've also found that this data can be really, really important and persuasive for different values that your faculty is dealing with on campus, including um, questions of enrollment. We are constantly, every semester, we're talking about our enrollment numbers. And what this data shows us is that the cost of educational resources does affect a student's willingness to register for a class or stay in a class. So again, there are lots of really creative ways that you can work with and persuade audience members to think about the multitude of impacts that affordability barriers have on student success. But there are other educational equity issues outside of affordability that can affect students' academic performance and classroom experience. Because inaccessible classrooms, including inaccessible classroom materials are overtly exclusive to many student populations. Right? So historically in our faculty deck, we spend a lot of important time focusing on this area of the problem, right? that connection between affordability and success. And we're really sort of working with faculty to understand that there are clear inclusivity issues that are also important for us to consider. And that here we're really framing as a sense of belonging in the classroom. So we've talked a little bit about students having to shoulder the burden of tuition costs and textbook costs, um, but I also want us to consider, for example, the culture of belonging that happens or doesn't happen on campus. This quote is a great one. I'm, I'm going to read it with you together. It says, racialized minorities and first generation students at four year institutions are less inclined to feel that same sense of belonging compared to their peers at other two year institutions. Right? Um, and this makes sense, right? Students who have access to the rules of the game, who know the hidden curriculum, oftentimes they aren't first generation college students, they're students who are legacy or have individuals who are able to kind of help describe that hidden curriculum to them. That means where can I borrow a textbook? Who do I ask for if I need assistance? Even that ability to translate a syllabus and course calendar to see when a textbook or course materials may be used for effective planning. All of those contribute to a sense of belonging. And students without that knowledge fail to be included, which can and does have short and long-term consequences, right? These students may feel like they aren't being seen in the classroom. And we have evidence right, that marginalized folks have difficulty succeeding in college. It's important for us to really ask ourselves how educational materials are so central to the kind of culture that we're creating for all different types of diverse students. So the problem, when we think about this overall problem, is there a financial barrier? Absolutely. Does that barrier clearly reduce student success and academic achievement? A hundred percent. And we want to investigate the kind of educational legacy and flexibility that traditional educational resources provide versus other opportunities to make sure that we're foregrounding that kind of sense of belonging and, in and inclusivity constantly. Right? And so this is where we're sort of going to transition from the problem with faculty to the solution. One thing, though, before I make that, that transition, 
as you begin to sort of develop the problem for yourself, I really strongly encourage you to think about integrating anecdotes and stories of some of those firsthand experiences that all of you have had with students on campus um, and the, the way that they're continuing to struggle because of a multitude of barriers.